Funding for the production of Folks is provided in part by the Friends of LPB. Up front today, we have a sneak preview of a documentary to air on LPB tomorrow night entitled The Road to Las Vegas, A Black Perspective. We conclude our Salute to Black History Month with a look at the Sisters of the Holy Family, the second oldest order of black nuns in the country. Several weeks ago, we had Senegalese art. Today, it's Senegalese music, as we introduce you to two of Senegal's most popular musicians, Arfan Kouyaté and his wife, Penda Diabete. I'm Rob Hinton, and we'll have those stories today on Folks. Everybody's just folks. Hello everyone and welcome to Folks. We have a very exciting program for you today, so let's get started. Up front, a sneak preview of a documentary on two black communities that migrated west to Las Vegas. One community was out of Fordyce, Arkansas, the other to Little Louisiana. The title of the documentary is The Road to Las Vegas, A Black Perspective, and it is narrated by television personality Greg Morris. Las Vegas was little more than a dusty desert depot when the town was established in 1905. Even in its early days, Las Vegas had a small group of black residents. In 1930, when the government announced plans to construct Hoover Dam, there were 150 blacks living in Las Vegas. When construction began, blacks joined the thousands of workers who migrated to the desert community. However, the Six Companies Construction Corporation, contracted to work on the dam, refused to hire Negroes. An investigation by the Secretary of the Interior led to a change in that policy in 1932. Despite that, of the several thousand member construction force, only 44 were black. The 1940 census listed 178 black residents in Clark County. They comprised little more than 1% of the population. In 1941, the federal government announced another major construction project that transformed the racial demographics in southern Nevada. The world's largest magnesium plant would be built 20 miles southeast of Las Vegas in what is now Henderson, Nevada. Construction of this plant brought the first mass migration of blacks to Las Vegas, a manpower shortage prompted basic magnesium officials to conduct a search for workers in the South. They heard it over the uh, radio and newspapers and different people going back, coming back, spreading news. I went out to the uh, employment office at uh, BMI and applied for work, and they gave me a badge. It's estimated that 80% of the black families migrating to Las Vegas in the 1940s came from Fordyce, Arkansas, and Tallulah, Louisiana. Las Vegas is located 1,500 miles west of Tallulah and Fordyce. A city noted for neon lights, gambling, and entertainment, Las Vegas provides a stark contrast to the rural lifestyle of the Deep South. Fordyce is a lively sawmill town, nestled in the densely forested area of South Arkansas. was established at the end of the 19th century when the sawmill was constructed. 
Many blacks left back-breaking work in the cotton fields and moved into town to find employment at the Fordyce Mill. Mill work offered more job security, but was not without hazards. We can remember back the stories of some of my older customers telling me how it was in Fordyce back during those groundhog sawmill days, and invariably they're when they talk about it, you can look at their hands and their fingers missing or they were injured when they worked in the sawmill. Black mill workers lived in shotgun houses, reminiscent of plantation slave porters, and were located near the sawmill and lumber yards. In spite of poor living conditions, black-white relations in the 1930s and 40s were outwardly civil in Fordyce. On the surface, the course of daily life ran smoothly and there were no civil rights demonstrations in the Arkansas lumber mill town. We didn't have any racial problems. It was segregated, but we, we didn't have any racial problems. As for certain, you know, like in Alabama, like they'd have in Lynches and all that stuff, and Louisiana, and Mississippi, we didn't have that problem. Other residents feel that the races peacefully coexisted because blacks in Fordyce knew their place and did not violate the unwritten social barriers. Only problem, uh really had that I didn't like. I couldn't go into any place that I wanted to go in. When you take a group of people who is not aggressive, then the racialist, the resistance, never manifested itself because it had no reason to. It seemed to have been a understanding that blacks had a place and you stay in your place and everything's fine. Little has changed in Fordyce in the last 40 years. Blacks can now own the mill quarters they once rented, but there's still no indoor plumbing and no whites live there. Now you can catch the entire documentary tomorrow night at 9.30 here on LPB. I think you'll find it very fascinating. Time now for our Pause for Pride report, which this week takes us to New Orleans. Our report focuses on the Sisters of the Holy Family, the second oldest order of black nuns in the country. Genevieve Stewart tells us more. In 1826, at the tender age of 13, the free young woman of color, Henriette Delisle, decided to devote her life to the poor, orphaned, and infirmed. The dream of founding an order of black nuns in New Orleans was born. Henriette's family denounced her, and her mother suffered a nervous breakdown over her squandering her inheritance on poor orphans and slaves. But she persevered, and 16 years later, took her final vows, and thus began the religious order the Sisters of the Holy Family. Well, it was founded in 1842 uh, by Mother Henriette de Lille. She was assisted by Juliette Godin and Marie-Jeanne Alico. Now, Marie-Jeanne Alico was a French lady who had come to the United States and in coming ashore, she fell overboard and was rescued by a black fisherman. And for that reason, she dedicated her life to working with the blacks. She never became a member of the community as such, but she always helped the sisters. From the humblest of beginnings and with the help of her closest friends, the sisterhood grew in numbers and spirit. Orphanages were founded, the sick were healed, schools were established, and missionaries expanded. They, they began very small, taking in elderly people, caring for the elderly, and also teaching catechism to the black children, free people of color, and to slaves. The Sisters of the Holy Family's congregation now numbers 250 nationwide, with sisters serving in Texas, Oklahoma, California, and Belize, Central America. Although the sisters still operate missionaries, they have concentrated on the opposite ends of the age spectrum, teaching the young and administering to the old. The sisters founded the country's first Catholic home for the aged, the Lafon Nursing Home. The sisters are also anticipating construction of a second senior citizen's apartment complex. They also have um, an apartment complex sponsored by HUD with 150 apartments. That is in the same area as St. John Berkman's daycare center. We had a piece of property in the back and they built the 
apartment complex there. We're also hoping that we will get another apartment complex to be built across the street near to the nursing home. See, the original idea was to build a high-rise apartment complex and then the people who live there later on would probably go into the nursing home. But we didn't have the money at the time, so we just built the nursing home. But now we are thinking that, we are hoping that the government will give us a grant. It's in the works. It might begin as early as June. Sister Mary Frances Borgia entered the order 80 years ago. She has written a stunning book about the sisters entitled Violets in the King's Garden and is planning to write a sequel. At age 99, her mind is still very sharp, except on one point, which many ladies are vague about. I entered in 1905. <laughs> And you were how old? I was uh, 19. 19 years old. And if I'm, if it's okay, how old are you now? No, I am 98. And. Um, I will be 99 on the 20th of January. She was the 20th of January will be my birthday. And sister, they tell me that you're 99 already. Well. You wouldn't cheat on your age, would you? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> At the Mother House in New Orleans, there are 75 sisters, five postulates, and novices. The decreasing number of women choosing to enter religious orders is of some concern to Sister Barbara Marie. We, we, when I entered, there were 15 of us in the group. Today, if you get two, you're doing well. Some years, they're not at all. I think it's a change in the lifestyle of people generally. Formerly, you know, parents would encourage their daughters or sons, at least one in a family, to enter. But not anymore. I think and that's because they question whether the religious life is feasible anymore. The United States as a country has become very materialistic. Nonetheless, the good works of the religious order and schools they have founded are not in jeopardy. St. Mary's Academy, begun 125 years ago, is bursting at the seams on a campus built to accommodate 500 students, but with a current enrollment of 750. St. Mary's has exceptional academic ranking. Its strong alumni association has 18 chapters nationwide. Alumni enthusiasm is not surprising, since there is not a room on the campus large enough to hold the standing room only PTA meetings. The sisters have a strong philosophy which permeates their teaching and is infectious. Well, our main interest is in teaching. We have sisters in many schools, in California, Texas, Belize, and here in New Louisiana. We have four schools here in the city, and then three in Lafayette, one in Opelousas three in California, two in Stan Creek, which is part of Belize. And what is it that you try to instill in your students? Well, the excellent moral living, first of all. That is important that you teach them from their early days what is right, what is wrong and give them a chance to aim high. The sky is the limit, regardless of what color you are or what nationality you are, you can always aim high. This is a special year for St. Mary's Academy and some of its students. The school will graduate its centennial class. 
two members of the 100th class share their aspirations and opinions of the Sisters of the Holy Family as instructors. Michelle, what are you going to do after graduation? After graduating, I would like to go to college and major in psychology. Where do you think you're going to go? Tulane. Tulane? Good. And what about you, Leslie? Well, I want to go to Howard University in D.C., but I'm really not sure what I'm going to major in yet. Thinking about accounting or even mathematics, nothing's that way. And what about engineering? I considered it, but but all the science involved, that's what kind of scared me away. Oh, now see, I thought you were going to do that because you know your way around the chemistry lab so well. <laughs> that would help, too. <laughs> you know, I'm still thinking about it, like I said, but right now I'm really not sure. Tell me, how many years have you been attending St. Mary's? This is my fourth year. And what about you, Michelle? This is my sixth year. Your sixth year. Are the sisters rough on you? Well... I guess they really want us to be young ladies, very mature young ladies. So they try very hard to make sure that we are mature young ladies, but they're really nice people. And this is going to be a special year for your class, isn't it? Yes, it is. We're the 100th class to graduate in St. Mary's system, so we're very proud of that. Have they made any special plans for this year? They have, but they won't tell us anything about them. They just oh. tell us there is something special that's going to happen, but we don't know exactly what. It's going to be a surprise. Yes. Would you trade anything for the experience of having gone here? No. I can honestly say no. St. Mary's has been an experience. That's just it. They try to develop everything. You know, not just a student, but a person. And that's important. I think I've gotten a lot from it. So I wouldn't trade it. If you had it to do all over again... No, <laughs> that's pretty rough to ask right after the summit. I mean, midterm exams, but. <laughs> um, I think I'd try it again. Of course, I'd know everything, so that would make it easier. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish you both a great deal of luck next year and in life that St. Mary's has prepared you for. Thank you. Thanks a lot. For over 150 years, the Sisters of the Holy Family have educated, healed, and cared. Perhaps their greatest legacy to black history is their devoted work in the classroom with the future leaders of tomorrow. We pause for pride and honor the Sisters of the Holy Family. Several weeks ago, we shared with you some of the art from Senegal, West Africa. Today we have music featuring two popular musicians from that country. The musicians are Afan Kuyate and his wife Penda Diabete. The string instrument that you see Arfan playing is called the Akura, and he made the instrument himself. Let's give a listen to some songs by Arfan Kuyate and his wife Penda. I'm 
On va jouer maintenant Kame Birama. Well, that's our program for this week. Thanks for watching. Next week, we'll have a look back at a sit-in protest that took place on the campus of Southern University 25 years ago. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Funding for the production of Folks is provided in part by the Friends of LPB.